All right, so this is the, uh, the Kingdom Parables uh, class, lesson number eight, the final lesson in our series. And today we're going to talk about the parables of the seed, and then another parable about the mustard seed, uh, and then a third one about the, uh, the parable of the workers, and these are in Mark chapter four and Matthew chapter 20, and we'll be turning to those at the right, right time. So uh, we've said the, uh, as part of our uh, study that the goal here for uh, this particular class was to understand the nature, the character of uh, God's kingdom and to do so from the teachings about the kingdom uh, that are found uh, in the kingdom parables. Um, good, it's a good place to go for concentrated information about this, about this topic. Uh, you and I in the church, we are the kingdom. Um, every time Jesus says, you know, the kingdom is like, he's also saying the church is like. Or when he is saying uh, in the kingdom, uh, we could just as well say in the church. In the kingdom, this is the way things happen. Well, in the church, this is the way things happen. Uh, things happen and take place. Uh, studying these is uh, really studying ourselves, actually. Our life in the kingdom, uh, how we should act in the kingdom, how does the kingdom operate? How different is life and the way we relate to each other in the church or in the kingdom as opposed to how things operate in the world? And so the study of the kingdom parables gives us some insight into these, into these differences. Uh, so what we've learned so far, some of the things that we've learned. Uh, first of all, uh, the kingdom is uh, small but powerful. You know, although small, when I say small, small in comparison to others in the world, other quote organizations in the world, the church has greater proportional influence, even if it is unseen. It's easy for us to become discouraged at times seeing how small, not just small numerically, but just it seems we don't have any power, we have no say, we, we can't quote, you know, make things happen like perhaps politicians or business people, even entertainers. You know, uh, they can get their message out to 10 million, million people in a moment. We have to work very hard to get our message out. And yet, despite all of this, the kingdom is still very powerful in proportion to its size. Uh, we've also found out that uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be in the kingdom, a, a valuable privilege to be a member of the church when we consider all the blessings we have, when we consider the protection that we receive, the protection we're promised, you know, God Almighty. Imagine, God Almighty has said to us, each one of us personally, I will never forsake you, I will never leave you. I mean, that's, that's quite a privilege to be part of a people that have received that personal guarantee from God Himself. Uh, we've also learned that um, people in the church grow at different rates depending on how they respond to God's word. And the bottom line actually is the greater the obedience, the greater the growth. Anybody who says to me, you know, I, I, I want to grow spiritually and I don't feel I'm growing spiritually you know, quickly enough or as much as I want to, and usually if you scratch the surface or if you dig down a little deeper into that person's life, you find out that, well, maybe you're not obeying God's word as much as you need to, ought to, you know, because these things are connected. Spiritual growth is connected to obedience. Uh, one other thing we learn, or another thing we learn about mercy, God's mercy is what allows us entry into the kingdom or the church. And our faithfulness towards God and mercy toward other people is what keeps us in the church, in the kingdom. You know, like the, uh, the graphic says here, you know, mercy, it, mercy is first and mercy is last. We get in because of mercy, we stay because of mercy. And then one other, you know, 
the big points, you know, the big ideas, and that is that God will purify His church at the coming of Jesus by removing all the hypocrites and the disobedience and the unfaithful. And uh, I've talked a lot about this particular point because a lot of the arguments and divisions and fistfights that take place inside the church, a lot of times it's just because one person decides that they will take upon themselves to decide who, who belongs and who doesn't belong. And that's not our job, not our job. So in our final lesson today, we're going to add a few more insights to make our study, well, this study anyways, complete. I, you know, I'm loath to say this study completes everything. There's certainly always more to learn. But as far as I'm concerned, some of the things I've tried to share with you, we're going to finish up today. So let's go to Mark chapter four, and we're going to read the parable of the seed. Very simple idea. Jesus says, <clears throat> and he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and he gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How, he himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So this parable is one of the simplest and most ordinary of the stories that are given. He simply recounts the cycle of planting and harvest, period. You know, once the seed is planted, the farmer waits. You know, when he said he sleeps, meaning he waits um, uh, for, the, uh, for the crop uh, to, to come, for the harvest to come. The seed and the soil, they do their work independently of the farmer's concern or lack of concern. Him worrying about the crop or not worrying about the crop does not affect the crop in any way, shape, or form. In the end, the harvest will announce itself and it will be time for the farmer to do his work of collecting the crop. Uh, and so what Jesus is describing here, a natural cycle with each thing happening in order and in its own time, all right? Now as a parable about the kingdom, okay, here's the point. What is he saying about the kingdom? Well, first of all, once the seed of the kingdom is sown, the cycle of reproduction and harvest has been set into motion. So despite storms and trouble and time delay, the work will eventually come to fruition. The job of the farmer, the workers, in this case us, the workers, you know, we're the workers, the job of the workers is not to figure out how the seed grows or worry about its rate of growth or, the, or try to force it to grow but simply to plant the seed, wait for the harvest. The other thing about the parable um, that we can draw is that there will be a harvest. You know, he says it's a natural cycle. You plant the seed, you wait, the harvest will come. It always comes. Now in a larger sense, God's plan of sending Jesus to plant the kingdom and then return for it, this plan will come to fruition Nothing will stop it since it has been set into motion. Nothing will stop it. And we know if we look through history, there's been plenty of attempts to stop it, but nothing can stop it. In a personal sense, uh, it promises all the workers that their planting will be rewarded with a harvest of some kind. They need not worry or become Impatient. You know when Jesus in another, the parable of the soils, you know, it said the harvest comes 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. Sometimes people see that as a kind of a rebuke. Oh, you only got 30. Oh, you got 60. It's not a rebuke. He's explaining how harvests work. There's never a hundred percent, you know, every seed produces the maximum amount. It doesn't work like that. Birds come and harm some and a plant gets too much moisture on this side or some animal eats half, of, you know. That's why he says in a normal harvest, there's 30, 60, 100. In the same way in the kingdom, 
not, you can work as hard as you want and, and pray as much as you want, the harvest will always be 30, 60, 100. Sometimes your work that you do with all the best intentions in the world doesn't bring as much fruit as you had hoped. And then other times you, know, you, 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 handed somebody a, you handed somebody a pamphlet or a track or something, you don't see them for five years and that person comes back to you, they went to preaching school and they become missionaries and they've baptized a thousand people you know, and you're thinking, all I did was give them a pamphlet. You never know. You never know. Well, I told you this story about myself very briefly to, that really underscores this. The, the ad in the paper that drew me to come and visit the church was only put in that newspaper one time. And I'm the only person that responded to it in any way. I was the only fruit of that ad. And the fellow who put the ad in is no longer a member of the church. And the church that was there is no longer there. And yet, in 38 years of preaching, I've preached to millions of people. I'm not saying that as a boast, I boast in the Lord. I'm just saying this tiny little ad that you know, meant only, nearly nothing, you know what I'm saying? In some way, God managed to multiply that thing and hopefully do something really wonderful with it. So you never know. You never know. So the growth of the kingdom uh, is imperceptible, it seems, even to those who are within the kingdom. But the harvest, meaning the good works, the changed lives, the new Christians, the, the gospel being preached, and so on and so forth, it's always visible in the end. So this parable adds the idea that the church is fruitful if it follows the natural cycle of planting the seed, the word, and then harvesting the word, or, or, or harvesting the result of the planting, good works, saved souls. And you go in and do a, uh, you know, a, a review of a church, a diagnostic, if you wish, of a church to see where are the strong points and where are the weak points to try to help them to grow. You know, I've, I've had to do that at times. And the thing I look at first is, are you planting the seed? Right, what do you mean? You know, I said, well, are you planting the seed? You know, is there any way at all that you are managing to proclaim the gospel? And when I say proclaim the gospel, I actually mean proclaim the death, burial, and Jesus are you actually doing something to get that message outside of the four walls of the church? And sometimes, well, of course we are. And then I say, okay, how? Pause. <laughs> well, we have a gospel meeting every April. Okay, good, there, there you go. There's the gospel meeting in April. What about May? What about June? What, about, you know, what are you doing on an ongoing basis to so see? Because you can't expect to have a harvest unless you sow some seed. It's kind of simple, isn't it? You'd be surprised how many churches <laughs> have lost the notion that they're wondering, why aren't we getting new members? Why aren't people coming here? Well, you're not sowing any seed, whether it be in your own community or in the larger country or internationally. You gotta, you gotta plant seed if you're going to get a harvest. All right, uh, next parable. So the next parable is the parable of the mustard seed that is also in Mark chapter four, 31 and 30, uh, 30 to 32. Uh, Jesus continues and he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. It's interesting that this is the only parable about the kingdom that is mentioned by three of the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke. There are no kingdom parables in the book of John. Now, uh, the story in this parable is of the mustard seed, truly a very small speck of a seed compared to other type of 
seeds. You know, if you've got a, 10 different seeds in your hand, usually the mustard seed will be the tiniest one of all. However, the plant or the bush could grow into a shrub, a shrub of over 10 feet in just a few weeks in the proper conditions. The idea is it's a fast, like bamboo. Have you ever gotten a bamboo plant? Man, that thing just grows in weeks. You can see the difference. Same idea with the mustard seed and the mustard shrub and the mustard tree. Uh, people of that place that you know, were listening to Jesus at the time, they knew of the amazing growth rate of this particular plant that Jesus described. So the point of the story was that such a small and insignificant seed could, in short order, provide shelter for birds of the air. Something that took regular trees years, even decades to accomplish. His point is you plant a tree, an ordinary tree, it might take you know, a, a decade before it had enough branches strong enough where birds could put you know, nests and so on and so forth. He's saying the mustard seed plant, you know, in, a, in a couple of months, it's able to do the very same thing. So uh, something that took regular trees a long, long time to do, the mustard tree could do in a short order. Again, the parallel is with the kingdom. And for those who see this in the context of what happened during and after Jesus' ministry here on earth, there's a vivid description of the speed and the growth of the church at the beginning. Think about it for a second. The parable speaks of a rate of growth and provision for birds in short order, meaning you know, mustard tree will grow up real quick and it'll provide protection fairly quickly for the birds of the air. Well, what's the comparison to the church? Well, the church began when 3,000 people were converted in a single day on Pentecost. And then within a few years, there were nearly 50,000 converts in the area. Within 30 years, it had spread throughout the Roman Empire. And then after four centuries, which is historically not a very long time, it was the official religion of the Roman world. That's pretty fast growth. Judaism, for example, or any other religion had never grown so big or so fast as Christianity. The birds finding shelter can be the, the lost who find shelter and safety in the kingdom, or it can refer to the fact that the Gentiles found rest and protection within Christianity, something they never found in Judaism. The church began with an executed leader and 12 apostles preaching his message, and it overcame every religious and political and military and philosophical group in its way. So this parable reinforces an idea about the church already made in other kingdom parables that the church is small and weak in comparison to other things, but it has great proportional influence and growth and strength. And so if you look at this parable you know, in comparison to other growth type enterprises, Jesus is saying the kingdom grows very quickly and grows strong very quickly. And it may not have been true to the people who were listening to him say the parable, the parable on that day, but the people who lived for another 10 or 20 years could remember this parable and then understand what he was talking about as they saw the rapid growth of, uh, of the church. Now the third parable, the parable of the workers, you're going to have to go to Matthew chapter 20 in order to read this one. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse one. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? 
They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing, no, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. So this story is a, an unusual one. A man hires people at different times of the day to work in his field. He pays all of them exactly the same wage even though they work different hours. The first crew grumbled feeling that it wasn't fair that they received the same amount for working all day as those received who only worked one hour. The landowner replies that he has been fair. He paid the first crew what they agreed upon for the work that they had contracted for. And we need to understand that a denarius was actually above average as a wage for that time. He paid the other men the same amount, not because of their work, but because he wanted to be generous. He finishes by warning his audience that not all things will be as they seem. Sometimes the first end up being last, and those who are last are given a better position. Unlike the parables of the harvest or the mustard seed, this parable has no easy or natural application or parallel in the everyday world. And let's face it, I don't know about you, but when I read this parable, you know, I kind of sympathize with the guys who worked all day long. It just doesn't seem fair. Even though they agreed for you know, a denarius, things kind of changed. You know, I'm thinking, well, if it were me, you know, oh, maybe I would have you know, topped it up a little bit. You know, give them a tip because you know, they worked all day. It just doesn't strike us you know, as, as, as fair, I guess. Now, for the kingdom, the parable teaches us several things that explain, I think, this sense of unfairness that we may uh, think that is happening here. A Couple of things that it teaches us about the kingdom. And you know, it's the easiest thing to forget that the parables here are teaching about the kingdom. If we just remember that, everything does fall into context. Oh, some of the things we learned. Number one, being in the kingdom is a matter of grace. Being in the kingdom is a matter of grace. The workers, let's face it, the workers had no jobs, any of them. They were unemployed. And the money was more than any of them, even the first group, would normally receive. So right off the bat, the money they were going to get for their work was going to be more than they could have made anywhere else. Being, so where's the parallel? Well, being in the church is also a matter of God's grace. He finds us through His gospel. We enter in through the blood of Christ. We um, remain because of God's grace. We receive more than we ever deserve in material and physical blessings. So God initiates our entry into the church. How? Well, He calls us. We don't find Him, He finds us. And He enables us to remain and blesses us every moment of our lives forever. Why? All because of His grace. All because He wants to do something mm, loving for us. Okay? So there's the first parallel. Being in the kingdom is a matter of grace. Just like these workers, the fact that they got a job was a matter of grace. Another parallel. The order of the kingdom is different than the order of the world. The first crew's attitude was indicative of a worldly 
not an immoral. They were not immoral. They were not even being ungrateful, actually. Their attitude was the attitude of the world. You know, and what is the attitude of the world? Well, I was first. I worked the longest. I worked the hardest. I deserve the best. I deserve to get more than everybody else. That's the attitude in the world. Now, this may be logical and it may be just in many ways, but this is not the way that things work in the kingdom. That's why we're uncomfortable with it. In the kingdom or in the church, the prize goes to the one who believes, not the one who deserves. In the kingdom or the church, the reward is for the one who trusts God, not the one who trusts in his work. I work the hardest, I work the longest. Yeah, no, that's not, that's not what counts in the kingdom. In the kingdom, you know, the currency in the kingdom is faith, trust. Things work based on faith and trust, not on who deserves this and who deserves that. And in the kingdom or the church, the one who pays his workers does so based on his goodness, not the goodness or the value of the work of his workers. I have received what I have received from God, not because of what I have done in the kingdom. I receive what I receive from God because He's good, because He's generous to me and to you, of course. This is why some who think that they are first in God's eyes, like the Jews in the first century, or some self-righteous people of today, they may end up being last in God's eyes. And those who seem to be last, sinners, those who struggle, how about those who come to God late in life? You know, the modern, the modern uh, example here, uh, some, uh, some young uh, woman uh, comes to know Christ when she's 10 years old and she's baptized at a very young age and never looks back never looks back, becomes a wonderful young woman, a young Christian woman, ultimately marries and has a family and raises a marvelous Christian family, maintaining a home, uh, uh, offering hospitality, uh, hospitality to the saints and so on. You know, just a wonderful life. And then you have somebody else who who, who, who is a worldly person, never gave a thought to Christ, and all of a sudden at 69 years old with a bad liver and a bad heart, they, they finally get it and cry out to God to, for help and for forgiveness, and they receive that forgiveness, and they become Christians, and three and a half months later, having gone to church maybe six times, they die. And where is that young, woman, where is she going to go who has lived till the ripe old age of 90 and all her good works, where is she going? Well, she's going to heaven. And where is this old boy here who just <laughs> made it by the skin of his teeth? Where is he going? He's going to heaven too. Is it fair, worldly wise? Well, no. <laughs> But is it of God's grace? Well, yeah. It reminds me of the old joke, you know, in a, at medical school, in the graduating class of 500 students, the person who came in 500th of that class, what do they call him? A doctor. <laughs> what do they call the guy who came in first? Uh, doctor. <laughs> yeah. In the church, the rules of the world are turned upside down. The first are last, the last are first. The weak are strong, the strong are weak. The leaders are servants, and the servants are leaders. So 
So as we finish the series, we add two last ideas to the five major ones that we have drawn from the parables about the kingdom. One idea, the church will continue to grow until its final harvest when Jesus comes. Nothing will stop it because God is the one who began it and He will be there for the end. Don't worry about the destruction or the failure of the church. Mm. Sometimes congregations fail for whatever reason. You know, a population shift. I've seen it happen all the time. You know, churches there planted in 1929, doing great for 50 years, and, the, you know, and then all of a sudden, whoops, that area of town becomes a, a different language. Maybe people of another country begin to congregate in that area, and that white Anglo-Saxon English-speaking church is no longer relevant to the Hispanic multicultural neighborhood in which it, it lives. And so you know, the elderly folks that you know, are still hanging on eventually sell the building, that church is done. And, but what happens? Uh, God raises up a young Hispanic uh, man uh, who loves God, uh, who you know, hears the call to ministry, who's saying to himself, you know what, there, there, there are 26,000 people that live in this, in this community and there's no church here and there's no one here to preach the gospel to them in their own language. And he rents a storefront <laughs> and he starts Bible school and classes and it, that, that church doesn't look anything like the stone, nicely appointed, carpeted church that stood on the corner of you know, 6th and Main for 50 years. It doesn't look anything like it. But it's a church. I mean, if it's based on God's word, obviously. So churches, not the church, but congregations, you know, they come and go for a bunch of reasons. When I have this discussion with people about you know, oh, what's going to happen if the church here, you heard about such and such a kind, is gone now, doesn't exist anymore. I tell people, don't worry about the church. It's God's church. He's the head of the body, not us. What would we do you know, if uh, Mr. Trump you know, he talked about Islamic terror? What if we do if terrorists somehow took over the United States? I don't know about you, but I just keep doing my job. It'd be a lot harder, you know? Uh, we couldn't put up a billboard on 23rd saying, come to the Choctaw Church. But I believe that I would see the same faces, but we'd be over at Barbara inside the garage with the lights down, you know? Why? Because we know what our job is. We just continue preaching the gospel. We continue sharing the faith. We continue taking the Lord's Supper on the Lord's day. Same job, same objectives. The church belongs to God. If we've learned anything about the kingdom parables, He's the one that provides the growth. And so the church continues until Jesus comes. Second point, the church operates differently than the world. In its best mode, the world operates on a principle of justice and fairness. That's in its best mode. You know, like Mr. Trump said the other night, you know, we want to be a land where we respect the rule of law. Well, as a Christian, I can amen that all night long. I wasn't expecting him to make a witness for Christ or preach the gospel. That's not what he's there for. At best, he or anyone else that takes his place is there for what? To uphold the rule of law so that we don't live in chaos. And as Paul says, so that we can live in peace in order to do what? Well, in order to do what we do, and that is to preach the gospel and to spread the kingdom. In the kingdom, however, everything operates on a principle of grace. God's grace for us and our grace towards one another. 
So Jesus provides the conclusion and the encouragement for these kingdom parables in Matthew 13, verse 51 and 52, when he says, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So if you understand these things, what are these things? Well, the kingdom parables. If you understand these things, you are now like scribes. And the scribes, of course, were those who taught. They were the teachers and also those who copied you know, the scriptures. You've become like the scribes, able to teach not only the old things, what was out of the Old Testament, you're not able only to teach what the Old Testament said and meant, but now you can add this new knowledge concerning the fulfillment of the Old Testament in the person of Jesus and His kingdom. That's what he's talking about there. If someone knows these things, he knows the full gospel. He knows the revelation of God in Christ and now, according to Jesus, is qualified to teach the Bible accurately. He knows the old, well, the prophecies and what it was about. You know, like uh, Brother North teaches on Wednesday nights, you know, the story of the, of the gospel as it begins in Genesis and works its way through the Old Testament uh, to the New Testament. And I've said many times, you know, the Jewish nation and the history and all of that, all of that was simply to establish a historical stage upon which Christ could enter. So if, if you understand that and you can explain all of that to someone, and then as the Lord says here, you can then explain from the kingdom parables what the kingdom is about and how to enter into the kingdom and how to stay in the kingdom and what will uh, eventually happen when Jesus returns, well then you are qualified to teach out of the old and to teach out of the new and to also teach about what will come and what will happen at the end. You're fully qualified now as a scribe, as a teacher, to teach anyone about the full message of the gospel. Okay, so I hope uh, that uh, each person here will find encouragement and security in the knowledge of these things about the kingdom, about the church, and hopefully you'll feel um, more confident and secure in the knowledge and, and more appreciative of what we have and where we are and who we are. We are members of the kingdom. We're part of the kingdom. And these are the instructions to us as to how we should live and hope and the kind of confidence we should have in the kingdom of God. Okay, that's our final class. Thank you for your attention.